On this Sunday night, teachers push back on back to school plans. Some say they won't be returning to work if class sizes aren't reduced in September. I don't envy them at all. I feel for them. A river ride in hot water. Why this annual float down sparked fears of an international incident. Plus, Belarus on the brink. The country's largest ever protest and warnings of a military response. And a remarkable rescue from the jaws of death. Global National with Robin Gill. Reporting tonight, Jeff Semple. Good evening and thank you for joining us. This is shaping up to be a critical week in defining exactly what school will look like come September, with several provinces making final adjustments to their reopening plans. Now at this point, in places with relatively few cases of COVID-19, classes will resume with few restrictions. BC, Saskatchewan and Manitoba will mostly rely on placing students in groups or cohorts to limit their exposure. In Ontario, Quebec, New Brunswick and Calgary, some grades will be required to bring masks. But class sizes and the ability to physically distance remain a key concern in many parts of the country. And some teachers say that if they don't feel safe, they simply won't be returning to the classroom. Heather Yurks West reports. When Molly Rain Dale begins grade five this fall, she won't be returning to her usual school. Yeah, I'm disappointed that I won't be able to go and see my friends again, but I do want to keep my family safe. We were very torn about, but because you, you want to make the right decision for your child, but we have decided to keep Molly home and, and do a homeschool program at home. It's a decision now facing parents across Canada, but it's not their decision alone. Teachers will soon have to head back to class too. And according to teachers unions across the country, many educators are worried that returning to school could put them at an increased risk for COVID-19. Many of those teachers that have registered complaints or concerns have uh, are immunocompromised themselves and are worried about what this means for them directly or their family members who are also or may be immunocompromised. Teachers unions in Ontario, Saskatchewan and Alberta say members are now weighing their options, looking at whether they have the right to refuse work if concerns related to their health and safety are not addressed. We put out seven priority areas that we would like to see addressed in the reopening of schools and I know that we need to address things like class size and cohorting and social distancing at school. The Alberta Teachers Association requested an emergency meeting with the province Saturday. That meeting will happen midweek. Across the country, back-to-school plans seem to be evolving by the day. Ontario announced more funding Friday. Saskatchewan plans to announce more money for school districts on Monday as well. As school districts work to adapt to the evolving framework, it means teachers likely won't know what their COVID-19 classroom health and safety conditions will be like until school returns. The way that our legislation works here in Alberta is that you have to go back to work first to see. Um, and we'll have to see where we are with that. In an unsafe work environment, work can be refused, adding one more layer of uncertainty to the school year. When classes resume, will teachers feel safe enough to stay? Heather Urex West, Global News, Calgary. An unauthorized annual event that typically attracts hundreds of people to the river that connects Ontario and Michigan planned to go ahead this year despite the Canada-U.S. border closure. But that event didn't quite turn out as planned. For more than 30 years, Americans and some Canadians have hopped in their inner tubes for the Port Huron float down. Law enforcement on both sides of the border urged people not to take part this year, citing concerns over COVID-19. Well, those warnings and the poor weather appeared to deter many floaters. However, the local mayor says the event still comes at a high cost because of the weather this morning and some of the warnings that uh, the attendance is lower than a Donald Trump rally. So what's happening here is still going to cost the taxpayers $100,000 to $200,000. Even with the lower turnout this year, the RCMP plans to remain on site and the river will remain closed to other traffic until 10 o'clock tonight. Worldwide, the number of confirmed cases of COVID-19 is growing faster than ever. In a 24-hour period, more than 294,000 people tested positive for the virus. That's the highest daily total since the pandemic began. There are now more than 21 million confirmed cases of COVID-19 around the world, with about a quarter of those cases in the United States.
And South Korea just reported its biggest COVID-19 outbreak in five months. The country added 279 new cases today, mainly due to local infections in the greater Seoul area linked to churches, schools and restaurants. There's now concern about further spread after thousands of anti-government protesters rallied in the city yesterday. And tens of thousands of people gathered in the capital of Belarus today in what's believed to be the largest protest in that country's history. The unrest started last week after President Alexander Lukashenko claimed a landslide election victory. His regime is now facing its biggest threat since coming to power nearly three decades ago. And as Redmond Shannon explains, Russia is now offering to help. The biggest rally yet. Tens of thousands of Belarusians dressed in the opposition colours of white and red. From exile in Lithuania, Svetlana Tikhanovskaya put out the call for the event. Opposition supporters say she was the rightful election winner. But they are no longer just protesting last week's result, which they say was rigged by President Alexander Lukashenko, but also the alleged police brutality that followed. New video shows the moment the first of two protesters killed this week fell to the ground in front of riot police. Authorities say he was holding an explosive device. The video is unclear, but it shows the man with blood coming from his chest. His partner insists he was unarmed and was shot. Also on Sunday, Lukashenko addressed a smaller group of his supporters, telling them NATO is ready to invade Belarus, something NATO denies. Lukashenko spoke to Russian President Vladimir Putin Sunday, the Kremlin now offering the Belarusian leader military support if required. I can't wait. I... I check the mail every day, even though it's... Calgary man Rick Gove has been living in the north of the country with his Belarusian girlfriend, but left to renew his visa a few weeks ago. There's one night where I called her and she was crying. She said that there were grenades going off like 400 metres from our house. And it's been really hard. I just wish I could be there uh, with her. Anastasia Karatkevich says police have become less aggressive as the week has gone on. With every next day... I would say that the fear is going lower and lower. We have it less and less and less each day. We are feeling stronger and more powerful. If nationwide industrial strikes resume Monday, pressure will only increase on Lukashenko. His next move could be critical. Redmond Shannon, Global News, London. One of two Canadians killed in that massive blast in Beirut earlier this month has now been identified. Three-year-old Alexandra Niger died in hospital from a head injury she suffered during the explosion. Today, Global News spoke to the young girl's grandfather, who lives near Beirut, and raced to be by her side in hospital. He says his granddaughter was at home with her mother, and they were living in a building that faces the port, and were blown away by the force of the blast. He also revealed the family was preparing to move back to Montreal later this year. They were already planning to move to Montreal by the end of September, and, and, and unfortunately happened uh, this explosion before that. They were blown from their place, and she couldn't hold Alexandra anymore. They were, you know, under doors, piano, and, uh, and they rushed her to the hospital. Uh, she had a severe injury in her head, and they did all they can. That blast in Beirut leveled buildings and overturned cars more than two kilometers away from where 2,700 tons of ammonium nitrate erupted. Canadian aid agencies are now working on the ground in Beirut and warn that basic supplies of food and water are now running out. Crystal Gamansing reports. It's just a few basics, non-perishables to help people get by, but the lines are long. <laughs> this mother of two says it's not a lot, enough for a week. She calls the process humiliating. Many are frustrated and feel hopeless. The Canadian Red Cross is on the ground working with local agencies assessing the country's needs. The full extent of the situation is still unknown, but officials are worried about the days ahead. Fresh vegetables, fruits, uh, fish, meat, all of this is very difficult to, to, to get. Uh, and the prices are on a rise. 
the inflation, as you know, was already quite high before this, but now it's going up because, of course, the demand is going up. According to the World Food Program, about 80 percent of Lebanon's food supply came through the Beirut port. The country's wheat flour supply is dwindling and may only last a few more weeks. Workers are busy setting up temporary cranes and storage facilities at the port. Food shipments are on their way to bolster the food supply. Pictures can't describe the reality that is here. Nothing but pure devastation. The blast on August 4th not only destroyed the port, but grocery stores, cafes, homes, even hospitals. Three are no longer functional and three others have been badly damaged. Violin de Rossier says the Red Cross is seeing people never considered vulnerable before because every aspect of life has been affected. And we caught a real life example. Uh, that's power cuts in Beirut. Okay, so you're witnessing what we are experiencing several times a day. Ooh, it's coming back. Power, food, shelter, there are many issues that need to be addressed. Helping Beirut get back on its feet will be a long-term endeavor. Crystal Gamanson, Global News, London. To the United States now, and a growing controversy ahead of November's presidential election. There are now reports the U.S. Postal Service is removing mail sorting machines. Today, Trump denied his administration is deliberately trying to undermine the Postal Service's operations at a time when demand for mail-in ballots is surging due to the pandemic. As Jennifer Johnson explains, it's all happening on the eve of the Democrats' national convention. Top Democrats are sounding the alarm and returning to Washington August 24th, hoping to question Postmaster General Louis DeJoy after allegations mail sorting machines are being removed from post offices ahead of November's election. Millions of mail-in ballots are expected to be cast due to the COVID-19 pandemic. This is the last thing we should be doing is politicizing the Postal Service. DeJoy, a top Trump campaign donor, was appointed by U.S. President Donald Trump in May. In June, postal workers reported some machines were being removed, with hundreds more slated to go. White House officials are now making this pledge. There's no sorting machines that are going offline between now and the election. The U.S. Postal Service Inspector General has also launched an investigation into the controversy. Even some Republicans are concerned about possible voter suppression. We want people to vote. It is essential, in my view, for a nation which is the leading nation of democratic nations in the world, the leader of the free world, for us to show that elections can be held in a free and fair manner. The issue igniting Democrats as they begin their virtual national convention Monday, formally nominating Democrats Joe Biden and Kamala Harris to try and take back the White House. We have got to do everything we can to come together to defeat Donald Trump, who in my view is the most dangerous president in the modern history of this country. Sanders and former First Lady Michelle Obama are the keynote speakers Monday night. Biden speaks Thursday night, likely focusing on President Trump's mishandling of the COVID-19 pandemic, which has killed over 170,000 Americans so far and plunged the U.S. into its worst economic crisis since the Great Depression. Jennifer Johnson, Global News, Washington. Coming up, CERB is coming to a close, sparking calls for a guaranteed basic income in Canada. Welcome back. Since the start of the pandemic, eight and a half million Canadians who lost income due to the lockdown have received the Canada Emergency Response Benefit, or CERB. But that benefit is set to come to an end next month. The federal NDP wants the CERB to become permanent in the form of a guaranteed basic income. Mike Lecouture has more. That's what I've got for 700 is this is my this is my part of the house. So. Rebecca Guzzo is renting the upstairs of a right. home in Hamilton because it's all she can afford. She's still trying to get back on her feet after being homeless and having her kids in social care. And it was a vicious circle because the social work student just didn't have the necessities of life. If my basic needs were met during my most difficult struggles, I would have been able to continue through with college. I would have been able to continue through doing my social work. 
It's why she's so supportive of an NDP motion to convert the Canada Emergency Response Benefit into a guaranteed basic income for those who need it most. Many seniors uh, living in Canada do not have a livable income. I know many seniors in my riding choose between rent and medication. Gazan says the pandemic showed the resources are there to help Canadians. Now, in 2017, Ontario started a basic income pilot project in three cities, but it was cancelled when the progressive Conservatives swept into power. The federal minister of social development was unavailable for an interview, but in a statement, a spokesperson said, the design and implementation of provincial programs like basic income is up to the provinces themselves. Through our investments, we have reached the lowest level of poverty in Canadian history by lifting over 1 million Canadians out of poverty. Adding, the government will explore all options to help people join the middle class. We now have a deficit of a third of a trillion dollars. Management professor Ian Lee worries about the cost of a basic income program, especially since the NDP's plan would be on top of existing social services. The parliamentary budget officer estimates a guaranteed basic income could cost up to $96 billion for a six-month period. That's in addition to the hundreds of billions of dollars the government has already spent on emergency pandemic aid packages. I don't know of any serious person who is saying that the government of Canada can run up deficits of a half a trillion dollars indefinitely forever into the future. Lee thinks a good middle ground could be a revamped employment insurance program that could make sure fewer Canadians get left behind. Mike LeCouture, Global News, Ottawa. The Canada Revenue Agency just shut down all online services after thousands of accounts were breached in cyber attacks. Anyone trying to log in to a CRA account is met with this message, telling them the service is not available. That means right now Canadians are not able to apply online for emergency COVID-19 funding, such as CERB. Hackers were able to access thousands of accounts using a technique called credential stuffing. It relies on databases of previously stolen login information. Still ahead, how a fist fight with a shark saved a woman's life. In China, zoo goers gathered to give their well wishes to the world's oldest living panda in captivity. Xi Xing turned 38 today, the panda equivalent of more than 110 human years. To mark the special occasion, her zoo threw her a birthday party attended by dozens of panda lovers. Now, according to the zoo, Xi Jing is one of only 30 giant pandas in the world to live past the age of 30. She looks great for her age. A heroic husband in Australia is making waves tonight after he sprung into action, jumping off his surfboard to save his wife by repeatedly punching a shark. The shark attack happened Saturday at Shelley Beach in New South Wales, a popular place to swim and surf. The man punched the three meter long great white shark several times in the face until it released the woman from its jaws. It hit her like, a, like with a force and threw her off the board. And so you get this kind of like a punch or something. I just saw the water splash and punch. And I knew instantaneously just from seeing other things like that. So I just started paddling. Oh, you see the mother of your child and your support, everything that's who you are. And so you just react. Wow, remind me not to pick a fight with that guy. The 35-year-old woman was airlifted to hospital with severe cuts to her right calf and the back of her thigh, but she's expected to make a full recovery. Up next, the show must go on. How concerts are making a clever comeback during the pandemic. Welcome back. It's easy to see why the music industry has been singing the blues during this pandemic. Around the globe, many concerts and festivals have been cancelled to curb the spread of COVID-19. But as parts of the world ease those restrictions, some event organizers are finding new creative ways to ensure the show can go on safely. Felicia Perillo 
has more. Gone are the days where thousands of people pack into a single space, standing shoulder to shoulder and side by side. Music festivals and concerts that draw large crowds will probably be off limits for a while. And so event organizers around the world are coming up with different ways for people to have a bit of fun. Take this concert in the UK, for example. Around 2,500 fans gathered at a park in Newcastle to watch a show by musician Sam Fender. But instead of people standing all together, groups of five are separated on a metal platform at the arena. Meanwhile, here at home, people are also experimenting with different solutions. Fans in Toronto were treated to an outdoor concert Thursday night, drive-in style. Music goers enjoyed the rec laws from the comfort of their cars. Definitely think it's going to be a little strange. We're uh, kind of far away back here, but um, it'll be interesting for sure. The new venue is located by the city's waterfront all summer long. It'll host fans for live concerts, sports games, and special movie screenings. I'm really excited to experience this. It's definitely once in a lifetime right now. Another once-in-a-lifetime experience, a new festival inspired by the pandemic. It's called Krugo Fest. The event allowed for people in Regina to book a private hotel room and attend a music festival from their balcony. We've put our stage on the rooftop of a parkade structure that's adjacent to uh, the Doubletree by Hilton in Regina. Uh, the hotel has 108 rooms with uh, balconies that overlook the rooftop stage that we've built. Morrison says tickets start at $600, which includes a room, a meal and some concerts. More than that, proceeds from each ticket will go to a local food bank. So it's basically like having a private box suite at a stadium or an arena. Um, everybody's kind of a VIP and everybody gets their own private space. So Morrison's advice, enjoy and embrace these new experiences. Because who knows, we may actually miss them once they're gone. Felicia Perillo, Global News, Montreal. And that's Global National for this Sunday. I'm Jeff Semple. Tonight's Your Canada is Greenwich National Park in Prince Edward Island. Robin Gill will be with you here tomorrow. Have a great night.